Greetings again, everyone. It's good to be here, and it's always good to talk to God's people. Uh, I have a great privilege of walking us through the scriptures uh, this morning, but before I do, I just want to uh, preface uh, this by saying uh, you have greetings from my wife, uh, Vanessa. Uh, she uh, couldn't come with me this time around because her leave was uh, not synced with mine, so hopefully when we are next year, it will be lovely for us to join you as we worship God together. Uh, the other thing I would like to highlight is that um, whenever we come to the Word of God, uh, we come with different mindsets. Some of you are thinking about what you're going to do afterwards. Some of you are carrying heavy burdens, and some of you are even blinded to see what is in front of you because of where you're coming from. May I invite you, as I invite myself, to lay this at the foot of a cross and to hear what God would say to us today. If the Word of God is living, if the Word of God is active, if the Word of God is sharper than any double-edged sword, then there's an intention to the Word of God. It does not leave the place of God without purpose, but it arrives to us to achieve that which it is sent out to do, Isaiah tells us. And so it is to us today that we listen with hearts of faith. I know some of you are still working through a black guy who lives in France, who's Zimbabwean, and are wondering how does that happen? Put that aside. I know some of you are asking the question, uh, when is he finishing? Or why hasn't he started yet? I'm getting to it, but <laughs> hearts of faith. Let's believe that God can, is, will speak to us today. And when he does, you and I have a responsibility. I may say stuff that may cause you to say Amen. Or ish. Wherever you may be on the spectrum of Amen Aish, the invitation is that we be doers of the word. So we continue with the series, The Resurrected Life, and the title of the sermon today is Behold Yahweh Nisi. So we are in part two. Behold, Yahweh Nisi. Now, I'll come to explain what the term Yahweh Nisi means, but I would like to introduce the sermon by highlighting that you and I are in this room and we are familiar with certain words. We share vocabulary. So when I say discipleship, something springs to mind. We have an understanding of discipleship, and the disciple making. In fact, this church accentuates disciple making as one of its distinctives or values. A church that makes disciples. If this is the case, then how we make disciples and who helps us to make disciples is of fundamental importance as well. Many in this room have been discipled. Many are discipling. But I would like to lean into this value a bit more, excuse me, as I play with the infrastructure. You see, friends, if you and I are aiming to be disciples, then what or who is discipling us is of critical importance because we become what we worship. Yeah. We become what we follow after. We become what we model. Some of us are being discipled by Netflix more than the Bible. Some of us are being discipled by Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, more than the living word of God. Yet we live in this ambivalent, ambiguous, slightly anachronistic, slightly 
dysfunctional frame where we say we are people of God, yet we are not following after God. So our claims are not matching our lives. And as we go through the sermon today, my invitation is that we hear the very vibrations of an invitation to discipleship, piercing to the core of our hearts, inviting us to be true and faithful disciples of Jesus Christ. So I ask, I ask you the question again, who is discipling you? Or what is discipling you? Now, the focus of today's sermon is on another one of God's names. He has many names that he presents to us. But today's focus is on the name Yahweh Nisi. Behold, Yahweh Nisi. And the text is taken from Exodus 17, 8 to 16. I'm going to read from the NIV, but the ESV will appear before me, uh, be, uh, before you, so allow me to walk through the scriptures together. Shall we read the word of God? The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Verse 9, Moses said to Joshua, Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of a hill with the staff of God in my hands. Notice the staff of God. We'll come back to that. Verse 10, so Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. We'll come back to that. Verse 11, as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Verse 12, when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady till sunset. Verse 13, so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with a sword. Then the Lord, notice the Lord is spelt with capitals there, and we'll come to that in a moment. The Lord said to Moses, Write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. Because I will completely blot out the memory of, the, of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, For hands were lifted up. To the throne of the Lord, notice again capitals, the Lord capitals will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Now this is a strange passage if we just jump into it, but you and I need to go a bit back to understand what has happened to the nation of Israel. This is their first war. They had not entered into warfare before. So there are no generals, there are no lieutenants, there are no colonels. There is no saluting here. These are mere peasants walking through the desert and they are faced with war. So maybe guys like only buff guys who can, maybe in the first battalion, we don't know. But what we know definitely is they'd never been to war before. Imagine you just crossed the Red Sea. Imagine manna had come from heaven, quail had come from wherever God called it from, water had been made sweet, and now you're at war. It's important to notice this point. And the other thing we notice is that before they enter or arrive at this juncture in time, there is a raiding tribe called Amalek. So Amalek may have heard that, listen, God has done something amazing for the people of Israel. They even have water in a desert. That bitter water that we tried to drink is now drinkable. We want some of that. 
So this raiding tribe comes to Israel to try and take over from Israel because the resource of water is valuable in the desert. So the Amalekites come to destroy the chosen people of God. Now, before we move too quickly, it's important to also highlight that the Israelites were not a very happy bunch. Now, manna just didn't arrive. There was a preface of grumbling before manna arrived. Chisanyama in the form of quail didn't just arrive. There was a preface of grumbling before Chisanyama. Water just didn't arrive. There was crying and even Moses himself almost got stung. He was afraid for his life. The grumbling was so intense that they were like, you, 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 we're going to kill you. We're now, we're now Moses, we're now. The grumbling was at the highest level, murderous in intention. Friends, this is a pausing moment. Many in this room are very good at saying, Jesus is good, hallelujah, praise you, in this room. But when we leave this room, we enter into a different mode of living. We're complaining, grumbling, a part and parcel of our vocabulary. Many in this room say, yeah, I love him, Jesus is Lord, only when I want stuff from him. But when it comes to the difficult challenges of life, we don't enter into a rhythm of life informed by the gospel, but we enter into a rhythm of life informed by grumbling. Many in this room, myself included, are very good at complaining and very good at highlighting the negative and not so much that, hey, there's electricity. When it goes, oh, you hear me, we have laments and psalms and songs that rise up every moment. We have actually have a best hit list of complaining. We are skilled in the art of grumbling. And as we grumble more and more, the voice of the gospel, or rather the witness of the gospel, becomes diminished even more and more. Grumbling and gospel witness don't walk hand in hand, but rather those who are convicted and convinced by the gospel are full of gratitude and praise. And all they say is, praise be to God who delivered me from the hands of the Egyptians. Praise be to God who delivered me from death. Where are you on the spectrum of praise? South Africans. Esh, Rama, this, Rama, this, what has it done now? Esh, this people, eh, this people, oh, that guy. Gospel first. Gratitude first. Appreciation first. Celebration first. May I give us a challenge? Instead of grumbling, shall we pray? Caught in a spirit of grumbling, may I invite you to pray. I know it's tough. I know things are not perfect. Excuse me as I work with the infrastructure. <coughs> I've got funny ears, so... Uh... Okay, super. We're going to give it one more try. But may I invite us to be those who celebrate what God has done more than what God is yet to do. Many are caught in the cycle of forgetfulness, forgetting what God has done. And like the Israelites, we grumble, forgetting that the greatest of all miracles happened for them where they crossed the Red Sea. Now, today's passage invites us to a different way where we know that apart from transaction, but that, that, we, that we know that it is not so much the transaction of getting stuff from God, 
but rather it is the revelation of who God is that grounds the believer. I'll say it again. It is not the transaction of what we get from God, but rather it is the revelation, self-revelation of who God is that grounds the believer. You see, we cannot worship whom we don't know. We cannot worship that which we don't know. And so for us to worship authentically, for us to be grounded in our walk with God, somehow we need to know this God. Not according to our formulation of him, but according to his self-revelation. And today we hear, behold, Yahweh Nisi. And to behold this Yahweh Nisi is to receive the revelation of who God says he is. As we read Exodus 17, we notice that Yahweh reveals his nature to us, not the other way around. God's self-revelation self is special. It is unique. We also notice that his attributes and character are consistent with his actions. Our responsibility, therefore, is to conform to his ways and not to make God conform to ours. I'll cover today's sermon quickly under three, three headings. First one, remember Yahweh Nisi. Second one, rally to Yahweh Nisi. And then rest in Yahweh Nisi. Now before I launch straight into this topic, allow me to explain what Nisi means. Now the Lord is my banner, the Hebrew being Yahweh Nisi. The Lord is my banner. Is often a, a, a phrase or a name of God that is misunderstood. You see, many in this room support teams. Uh, I, I know we do. Uh, and if you have ever watched a football match or been to a football match, uh, team supporters carry banners with the names of Pirates, uh, Chiefs, and Downs, uh, uh, the Mighty Reds. Uh, and no, lately, very few Manchester United. <laughs> Very few, I don't know why. but uh. So they carry banners made out of cloth. And these banners represent their allegiance to their team. As we think about banners this way, it is helpful, but what Moses is writing about has nothing to do with fabric. A banner in the ancient times was a pole. A pole that stood at the top of a mountain or a high place where everyone could see. And as long as that pole stood, messages were being transmitted to those who viewed the pole. And this pole just didn't stand. It was erected at a time of warfare. And it is where the army could focus on when they were fighting to gain their instructions down on the battlefield. Now, friends, you and I are not involved in physical warfare. Uh, Paul tells us that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but it is against spirit principalities and powers. Therefore... Where we view our instructions coming from informs our reaction to day to day living. Now, this banner was a pole that had inscriptions around it. And as armies fought, what they would do is they would look to the banner, which was on a high place or on a mountain. As long as that banner stood, they knew they were not defeated and they would continue fighting. If they lost themselves or their bearings around a battlefield, because it was not just a battlefield located in the in a five by five square meter area, no. You could fight somebody and end up maybe 20 minutes down the road. Because ancient warfare would mean you'd fight your enemy until you vanquish them. So you could end up 20 minutes down the road. Now this banner was the reference point as you were fighting. Now listen to what some of the Old Testament writers say. 
He lifts up a banner for the distant nations. He whistles. That's a beautiful picture. He whistles for those at the ends of the earth. Here they come swiftly and speedily. The banner also functioned as a rallying point. I don't know about you, but if ever you have been in a building and you hear the fire alarm go off, there is a place you are supposed to congregate. The banner functioned as a rallying point. So two things, safety and instructions came from where the banner stood. And God is saying, I am that. So Isaiah 5.26 is what I've read before. Let me read Isaiah 30 verse 17. A thousand will flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you will all flee away till you are left like a flag, flag staff on a mountaintop, like a banner on a hill. It is only later that the banner became a flag. Wave your flag. Wave your flag. So if a banner in Moses' day was a decorated pole, its function has theological significance for you and me. Now, I would like us to keep these two points of safety and instruction in our minds as I develop the points that I mentioned earlier. Let's move on to remember Yahweh Nisi. The word remember in the Bible carries deep theological significance because we are not just recalling, but rather we are being shaped by what we are remembering. So when we remember, we are entering into a sacramental act that shapes the present from an event that happened in the past. So when I drink of the cup and eat of the bread, I am participating in something that is ancient that influences my life today. What are you remembering? Are you remembering the gospel and what it has achieved? Or are you remembering something else, how your daddy beat you up and did not give you the opportunity for that or did not help you to grow into the man you're supposed to be? Is that the narrative that shapes your remembering or is it the narrative of an apocalyptic event of Jesus entering your life and transforming you to become a new creation? This passage invites you and me to remember Yahweh. Moses even is told by God, put this altar aside and tell Joshua, Because remembrance is critical to faithfulness. Those who carry this on their fingers, we're not just decorating our fingers because the finger needs decoration. No, 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 no. There's a covenantal remembrance that influences the way I behave, speak, and am. Remember, Yahweh Nisi. Exodus 17, 8 to 11, quickly. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses and Joshua said to Joshua, rather, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I'll stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Remember, the staff of God is the same staff that split the Red Sea. You look at the staff, you remember. Ho, 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 staff of power. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. The passage is the first time Israel goes to war, as I said, but until now, they've been wandering the desert without confrontation. I said before, the Amalekites attacked the Israelites because they wanted their resources. Another striking aspect of this passage is that the same stuff that strikes the Red Sea is the very stuff that Moses lifts up. In fact, Moses does not call it his stuff. It is the stuff of the Lord. He calls it the stuff of God because he knows that 
for us to experience lasting, eternal victory, it is God who acts primarily, not so much us who act. Friends, it is first God who makes the move for you and I to be saved. We were dead, absolutely dead. Imagine trying to tempt a dead corpse with Chanel number five. Hey, hey, Vora, man, wake up. I've got Chanel here. As beautiful as Chanel may be, uh, and this lovely fragrance of Chanel, the thing is dead. It stinks even. It takes a living being to awaken to the senses, to have their senses awaken to the beauty of that fragrance. Moses knows that God has worked powerfully in his life and in the life of a nation, and the staff reminds him of God, not himself. Friends, whenever we grumble, it is a sign that we have forgotten the mighty acts of God. An old song, an old hymn, children's song, count your blessings, name them one by one, then you will remember what the Lord has done. If ever you catch yourself in the spiral of grumbling and complaining. Just take a piece of paper and start numbering, what did you do for me lately? And like the old gospel singers, start writing it down. You wick yourself out of grumbling into a place of gratitude. Perhaps we are going through a challenging time where we have attempted all kinds of spiritual responses to the situations we may find ourselves in. What this passage teaches us is that it is not the strength of our efforts that we should rely on per se, but rather, even as we work, we are invited to know that God is taking the first step, that God has worked powerfully in Jesus and continues to work for us, not as a servant to us, but rather, he is for us. Yes, we pray. Yes, we give. Yes, we evangelize. We teach. We show compassion. We pastor. We fast. But in all that we do, we never forget that our efforts are a small fraction in comparison to what God is doing. We have the great privilege of co-laboring with God. Like a father who's washing his car and the son comes to the father son is five years old. The son may play with the water and help wash the part of a car. God is like that with us. He can do it all by himself, but we have the great privilege of co-laboring with him. Maybe we loved the Holy Spirit, pursued spiritual gifts, yet today we are not zealous. Maybe we need to repent and come back to a place of remembering how God saved us and how God sustained us. Because we have taken for granted the goodness of God and have descended into grumbling. Remember Yahweh Nisi, the God who rescued you. The God who rescued us from our own decadence. Maybe you are in here and you are yet to be rescued. I'll talk to you in a moment. Second point I want to highlight, rally to Yahweh Nisi. Rally to Yahweh Nisi. Now the word rally has been taken over by political activists and political agents, and whenever we hear rally, we just think of a group of people gathering to hear political demagoguery and political ambition and political... um, It may mean that. But the way I'm using it here is about running to a place of safety. Running to somebody who offers something. So we rally to Yahweh Nisi. Excuse me, I'm just going to change this if that's okay. My apologies. Thank you. Maybe a bit lower. So rally to you, Amenesi. One of the lingering memories I have from high school is about the fire alarm. Fire alarm goes off. We all need to congregate. Roll call gets called out. And if you're not there, you're, oh, yeah, you're in trouble. Detention. But the fire alarm rings in my mind whenever I hear Yahweh Nisi. Why? 
Because the picture of a place of safety is what this term teaches us of. You may be wondering why I'm telling you about this story, me remembering a fire alarm in high school days. But the point is, whenever we rally to someone or rally to something, we are actually running to that item or that someone. Friends, when we speak about remembering Yahweh Nisi and rallying to Yahweh Nisi, one of the things we need to notice is that God functions as a spiritual assembly point where we run to. Now, many in this room are so used to getting into trouble and then crying out, Yahweh Nisi, come over here. You get yourself into all kinds of trouble, and then Yahweh Nisi, where are you? Come over here, please. It doesn't work that way. There is a designated place, a designated assembly point where we run to. And that place is a strong tower. The righteous run into it, and they are saved. We run to God. Perhaps we have actually created false assembly points where we run to to try and find false senses of security. If we are in that mode of living, may I invite us to consider and actually to taste the goodness of a good and a safe space. <laughs> a safe space where Yahweh Nisi gives us true safety. Man-made, human-made assembly points of safety can only help us to a point. Ultimately, they disappoint. Perhaps you're in here and you're not a Christian. And your safety is in running to things that give you temporal senses of pleasure, security, and fake joy. Perhaps you are in this room and you have tasted of all kinds of security that sells itself as security, but you find yourself in trouble time and time after again, and you're moving in a spiral, moving in this vicious circle where safety is not found. May I invite you to rally to Yahweh Nisi. But how do you do that? The psalmist in 121 says, lift up my eyes to the hills where my help comes from. My help comes from the hills, the, from, from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. As we lift up our eyes to the hills, according to the psalmist, we find security and safety. But may I invite you to look up to a different type of hill where there was a crucified man where either side of this man were thieves, robbers even. This man died a sinless, he lived a sinless life, yet he died the death of a criminal on our behalf so that we might be rescued from our own criminality and find what it means to truly be alive. This rescue that he offers through his death is for you today. So Joshua fights or fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. Verse 11, as long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. Now Joshua, this is the first time Joshua is mentioned in the Old Testament. And this Joshua, the name Joshua actually is the same cognate as Yeshua. So we see images of Christ in this passage. We see a type of Christ in Moses. We see a type of Christ in Joshua. And we see a type of Christ even in Israel. Because Jesus is the true, or should I say, he is the embodiment of Israel. 
So echoes of what God is going to do in redemption are already present in this passage. My friend, if you are in sin, caught up by all kinds of sin, the rescue mission of God did not begin yesterday. It began way before you existed. And God has been planning for your rescue, for your deliverance, even as displayed in this passage. You are more loved than you can ever imagine. You are loved beyond measure that the plans for your salvation, redemption, and reconciliation with God have been ongoing before you even existed. This is how much God loves us. He has been working to rescue. So we rally to him. Maybe we are in this room And time and time again, we fall into trouble. And perhaps you're listening to the sermon and your history of running to false banners has created a sense of void in you, emptiness. May I invite you to Yahweh Nisi, the good life. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 12, verse 1 to 2, let us lay aside every weight, sin, which clings so closely. And let us, notice, it's, a, it's the Greek, they call it the hortatory subjunctive. It is not just, let me, let us, together. It's a communal thing. We lay aside sin, not in individually, oh, I've just shunned sin alone. Hey, look at me. Together. We shun sin in community. Let us. Run with endurance the race that is set before us. I'm not a runner, but I've been told but that runners, when runners run, they have this encouraging thing that they do for each other. They pace each other. Jono, you can tell me more about this. But there is this, let us. So let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus. And that looking... It's not just gazing to the floor. It is an elevation of your view to Yahweh Nisi. It is an elevation of your view to a place of salvation that is high above. The founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him and endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12, 1 to 2. The last point I want to highlight is a rest in Yahweh Nisi. Exodus 17, 14 to 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it. I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner, Yahweh Nisi. He said, For hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Now, the Amalekites don't exist anymore, and if they do, please let me know where they live. But what I do know is that there is an enemy that was defeated once and for all by what Jesus did. Now, the blotting out of the Amalekites is basically a shadow or a prefix to what is happening in the defeat of Satan, sin, and death. What are you afraid of? What holds you prisoner? What is raiding you day and day in and day out? May I invite you to rest in a place of security, and the place of security is a person, Yahweh. God has destroyed the Amalekites. He has done something even more profound in defeating Satan, sin, and death. Satan is not the undisputed champion of anything. He is a defeated enemy. Sin may masquerade as powerful, but rather it is devoid of its power because Jesus has won defeated it once and for all. Thank you, my Hebrews preacher. What are you struggling with sin-wise? 
if you're struggling with that thing, whatever it is, alone, may I invite you to the space of community where sin is defeated communally. The church is not a place where we grade my holiness versus your holiness, but rather it is a community of the redeemed gathered together, comparing scars of redemption and praising the one who heals us of our, redemption, of our, of our sins. What scar are you carrying? Chances are somebody in this room has been scarred or wounded that way, yet they lift up their hands confidently, knowing that Christ redeemed and rescued them from that. Are you ashamed of your sin? And if you are, there is hope. And the hope is there is rescue in Christ Jesus, where your sin will lose its power exposed to the power of a cross. And the power of a cross has already announced the defeat of your sin. It is finished. Or as the high tongue will say, finish and clara. <laughs> Friends, there is a concept in... Christianity called obedience. We not only celebrate what God has done historically, but we continue to walk in what God has done for us. It's not enough to experience the moment of great victory, but rather we continue to walk in that. And what we learn from this passage, again, is a call to remember but we remember through obedience. The celebrated theologian Eugene Peterson once said, discipleship is a long obedience in the same direction. A long obedience in the same direction. Many of us play staccata with our spiritual lives we sing and live in staccata. Or discord. We begin the, with the tune and then, hey, we fall out of the tune. Hey, and then we, it's a bit like a trap song. <laughs> I'm like, sing in tune, man. We are invited to a long obedience where we are consistently doing the same thing over and over and over again. Why is it because we are boring or bored? No, it's because this is how we remember Yahweh Nisi. Faithfulness is not built by a day or two days. It is a lifetime of doing the same thing over and over again because we are convinced, we are convicted, we are consumed by a love for Yahweh Nisi. Friends, as we remember this name of God, the ultimate invitation is to worship this God. When we remember, our hearts explode with worship. Perhaps you are in here and you have stopped singing because you're carrying heavy stuff in you. This passage is fuel to praise. Perhaps you are in here and you are angry, so angry that every conversation in you results in you resent, mentioning the people you resent. And you are nuclear whenever you speak about certain people. Remember the grace of God. Remember Yahweh Nisi. As I come to a close, I would like to invite us to read John 3, 13 to 18 together. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whoever believes in him 
may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Friends, the resurrection life has an element to which we respond in worship to what God has accomplished. And by highlighting that Corinthians opens up with mention of a cross, it mentions the cross that is foolishness to the Jew, is foolishness to the Greeks. It doesn't make sense. And to the Jews, it is a stumbling block. And it closes with mention of the resurrection. These two bookends basically make Corinthians, the cross and the resurrection. We are living in view of the GPS of the cross and the resurrection. Are you lost? Look at the cross. Look at the resurrection. Are you unsure? Look at the cross. Look at the resurrection. Lift up your eye to Yahweh Nisi, who actually has his fulfillment presented to us in the person of Jesus Christ, who died and who rose again. Christian, look at the cross. Look at the resurrection. Non-believer, come and look at the cross and look at the resurrection. Because only in the cross and in the resurrection can you really know the good life. Shall we stand? Now, the spectrum of Amen and Aish may have still be in our hearts as we reflect on what we discussed this morning. I would love us to be doers of the word, not only hearers. So wherever you are, I invite you to enter a posture of openness before God. If you want to close your eyes, if you want to keep them open, it's fine. If you want to lift your hands, it's fine. As the band plays behind me, the invitation of this passage is that we acknowledge who God is and we respond in a life of worship. What are you carrying? What are you carrying that has distorted your understanding of the good life in God? What are you carrying that has distorted your understanding of Yahweh Nisi, a place of safety and a place of instruction? May I invite you, may I invite us to lay it down and to adopt a new way of being where we follow after God, follow after Christ wholeheartedly.